Tonight, a panel of some of our finest scientific minds will hear their take on nuclear subs and the risks of protesting during a pandemic. And we'll take a trip to the future exploring AI and outer space. Welcome to Q&A. Hello, I'm Stan Grant. It's great to be with you. Joining me on the panel this evening, artificial intelligence expert Toby Walsh, Nobel laureate and ANU Vice-Chancellor Brian Schmidt, wildlife scientist and science communicator Vanessa Perotta, quantum physicist and innovator Michael Biersick, and international air quality expert Lydia Morawska, who helped highlight the airborne spread of COVID. And a little later, we'll be joined by astrophysicist Kirsten Bank should be part of our discussion. We're delighted to bring together such incredible minds for you tonight. Remember, you can stream us live on iView and all the socials. Quanda, as usual, is the hashtag. Please join the debate and publish your comments on screen from Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Let's get to our first question tonight. It comes from Jessica Quist. The recent protests by construction workers have frustrated many Victorians. It seems to have been an excuse for violence and disorder and a display of toxic masculinity in its purest form. These protests are also potentially super spreader events. Is it fair that our healthcare workers will be expected to treat patients who've actively defied public health orders? And is it fair that hospital beds may be potentially taken away from those requiring acute care? How do we manage this violence and how do we manage the risk to the community? Brian Schmidt, I want to go to you first of all on this. I know you've written a lot about what you see as a increasing political populism, some of the fear and anxiety of this age and, and what drives this. When you look at these protests, what does it tell you? Well, it tells us that we do have a small part of the population of Australia that are fed up and uh, really aren't buying in, I think, to the Australian project. Uh, and so that is a problem. Uh, so education, I think, is really, really important, being able to have a conversation with people. But Australia, you know, as a population, has made a decision of how to deal with COVID. Not everyone is happy about it. But clearly, violence that we have seen is not the right way. And we have made a decision as a population, and our, and our politicians have on behalf of us, to say, this is not OK. And so I do think we need to clamp down on it. Uh, we need to find a way to get, of course, to being able to open up as fast as we can. But ultimately, we want to do it in a way that's safe and doesn't end up uh, killing or uh, making, I would say, really bad health outcomes for thousands upon thousands of Australians. Yeah, and Brian, you rightly point out that the small number, but of course, the violence that we've seen, um, the impact that that has is greater, perhaps, than the numbers themselves. And Vanessa, Brian said something interesting there, and he talked about education communication. There are people here, apparently, amongst the protesters who are anti-vaxxers, who in spite of the evidence, in spite of the arguments, simply don't believe it. How do you communicate a message to people right now who don't want to believe what they're told? Well, this is an incredibly tricky time for many people, and whether you believe to, to be vaccinated or not, that's, that's your choice. The information is out there. However, the way in which we provide this information can be a little bit tricky and it's, it's, it's kind of time in Australia that we hit that refresh button on how we communicate in science and how we see science. And this might be one potential example, definitely one example of that. But maybe we need to think about assessing how we provide this information to different demographics and, 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 and provide that through people who they can relate to. So maybe there's a minority of people that they might look up to and they'll, they'll see someone and if they have those people providing those key messages, that might be one way. But there are so many and we are living in a one in 100 year event. Mm. This is very tricky, but communication is key. And the good thing is Australia is providing information on why we should get vaccinated. And there is a lot of information, thankfully, coming from overseas. I and mean, we've got the, the luxury of seeing countries overseas testing people as well as vaccinating people and there's huge sample sizes that yeah. us in Australia can look towards to see if these types of new science is working. 
Lydia, when you look at a protest like that, and we often hear um, concern about what could be super spreader events, we've seen other protests and they haven't turned out to be that, but what did you take away from these protests and what potential risks there may be, given that Victoria is still going through this outbreak of the Delta strain? Well, uh, it's a very difficult question and it depends whether there are infected people in the crowd or not. If there are and if there are others who are not wearing masks and they are in the proximity to those infected people, they have very high risk of being infected. So, yes, potentially events like this can be super spreaders. On the other hand, we are talking about events in open air. In open air, dilution of the mm. virus is much faster. So, therefore, in general, outdoors, the risk is much lower than, uh, than indoors. Uh, and an infected person during, during a protest would potentially infect somebody next to that person, but not the whole crowd. It's mm. not like an indoor space where one infected person can in infect the whole crowd. So that's, that's yeah. the reason why we don't see this many outbreaks during the protest. Yeah, and just on that as well, ABC has been able to report that there was a man at the protests um, who has tested a positive. He's in hospital um, at the moment as well, just to go to that, that, uh, that, that issue that you raised there about someone potentially being infected. Well, there was one person there that we've been able to report who is infected. Um, Michael, Brian talked there about the Australian project um, and that people are not on board with the Australian project. But it does raise the question, and I think, you know, you're originally from the United States as well, what it raises questions about politics during this time and, and questions of personal liberty and freedom. I know in the United States, whether you wore a mask or not became a political statement. But when we talk about an Australian project, when we talk about a, a joint effort in dealing with a pandemic, there are other factors as well beyond the health factor that drive the sort of protests we've seen, aren't there? I, I mean, I broadly think so, but I, I do think it's worth saying that this is a really small part of the population. Mm. Broadly, people are on board, and the best way to know is to look at the vaccination rates. In New South Wales, we're now at 84% first dose, which indicates that 84% of adults are on board with this project. We really end up talking about a small but very loud minority. And, you know, to some of the earlier discussion, um, yes, there is a need for scientific discussion, for education, for communication. But at the end of the day, we, we end up with a, with a virulent minority of people who are uh, either by choice or by, you know, their wiring immune to fact. And so we need to take a different approach. And for them, I mean, I, my, my overall view of this is we are the victims of the greatest intelligence operation in history, that misinformation is being weaponized against us. Uh, it's not all that secret, in, in fact. Uh, and this is uh, fomenting violence in a really tiny part of our population. Our job is to help those who are mm. interested in hearing the truth and mock endlessly the people who are unwilling to embrace the truth. Toby, pandemics um, in the past have seen just the sort of events we're seeing now, aren't they? They've thrown up just these types of protests. Yeah, um, history is in some ways repeating itself. Um, if you go back to the 100 years to the Spanish flu, there were riots and protests then. People were upset about um, mandatory vaccines and, uh, and, the, and the lockdowns that happened then. So um, I do think actually there's a strange... A uh, cycle of history that these happen once every hundred years or so. Mm. It's just long enough for us to have forgotten the lessons we learned last time, the, the pains that we had to go through, um, the sacrifices we had to make. That was something that our great grandfathers, great grandmothers had to live through. And now we've forgotten those lessons and we have to learn those painfully enough. And, and Toby, given um, what we're on the cusp of as well with changes, rapid changes when it comes to things like artificial intelligence, <laughs> might this be the last of this type of pandemic that we live through? I'm hopeful that this actually might be the last pandemic because we now... It used to take a decade to develop a, a vaccine. Um, this vaccine took a year. Mm. Uh, that's unprecedented. But now we can develop vaccines. I mean, some, some of these vaccines, like the mRNA vaccines, you can develop in a, a couple of months. Mm. And so if we can learn how to distribute the vaccines, and that's not just to us, but that's to the whole world, and we haven't worked that problem out, because this pandemic is not over by a long mm. way, mm. because we haven't really begun to vaccinate the third world. And we can't breathe ca safely until everyone, everyone on the planet, has had the vac has such a chance at least to have a vaccination. Yeah. We're talking about boosters in some countries and other countries have not even had first shots yet. Our next question comes from Vera Mirinenko. 
The Soviet leader Brezhnev told the people that the Chernobyl power station was safe enough to build in his own kitchen, according to my relatives living nearby in Ukraine. What risks does this government impose on the people of Australia from the nuclear-powered submarines? Lydia. <laughs> it's a big question, isn't it? What, what risks? But where do you begin with where, something like this? Yeah, where, where, where do you begin? Well, in principle, as a nuclear scientist understanding nuclear power, I'm in principle not against uh, application of nuclear power for energy generation. However, the question here is not really about science, it's about the instrument we are using, the instrument are the submarines. When uh, students come to me and ask me, uh, shall I use this instrument? I'm, I'm asking what's the purpose, what's your aim? And here the question is, what's the aim of using this spe specific instrument? And this aim hasn't been clearly communicated. Uh, we've heard that this is because this is a superior te technology. Superior technology for what? These uh, submarines are uh, quieter, can go uh, underwater for much longer, but on the other hand, they cannot come closer to the, um, uh, uh, to the land because in some places, because they are very big. They can't enter many ports. So therefore, what is the Australian national goal of using mm. these submarines? And this hasn't been communicated. One of the things we have heard, Lydia, is, is the increasing geopolitical threat and potential conflict in the Indo-Pacific and preparing us for that. And I want to go to Brian Schmidt on that question in just a moment, but you raised something else interesting in your answer there, and that is the question of application beyond submarines. We are the sixth nation now to, get the, to, to be pl planning to get this sort of technology, but the only one that would not have a nuclear weapons program or a nuclear energy program. Should that be that part of this discussion as well? We're going to be talking about climate science some um, later in the program, but the question of nuclear energy, should that also be part of our conversation right now? Lydia? Oh, sorry, yeah. I, I thought you were asking, ask, asking Brian. Well, uh, as I said, I'm not opposed to nuclear energy. However, being very much aware of all the challenges related to nuclear energy, to all the costs, all the other problems. So this is not the first technology to consider. There are other technologies to consider, but nevertheless, this could be considered within the package of energy uh, solutions for a country. In Australia, however, there are other sources which I would consider first. There's uh, plenty of sunshine, there's plenty of wind. So these are technologies to consider, to consider mm. first. But as I said, nuclear energy could be one element of the package. Michael, you're nodding along. Part of the answer where you're nodding along too. Yes to nuclear energy or <laughs> yes to solar? Well, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit ambivalent, right? I think nuclear should be part of the discussion. But I want to take a step back to the, to the undertone of the question, right? Why was, why was Chernobyl such a disaster? Why has it scarred people in their memories mm. for so long? It was because the government lied so much. I mean, the famous, the famous quote now from, from the miniseries is, uh, every lie we, we tell incurs a debt to the truth, and sooner or later that debt is paid. You know, this is the only panel that's been on this show in quite a long time where every single member of the panel for a living tells the truth. <laughs> right, you, you, and, and you are you are a quantum physicist. I, I the know, truth I know, of the I know. Physics world may be relative, or well, there may I have be multiple the, truths. I have the easiest way out. That's right. <laughs> but 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 the, the the fundamental aspect here is that if we're going to embrace technologies like nuclear energy, even if we're going to build semiconductor manufacturing on shore, which has huge amounts of toxic chemicals involved in order to do that, fundamentally we need to have trust in the policymakers to inform us accurately about what the risks are and not to conceal those risks. So unless we fix that problem, the trust deficit in government, I think that nuclear is actually going to be politically very hard. And, and Brian, um, one of the, the questions Lydia raised there is what is the purpose? Well, we know part of this is the changing geopolitical uh, uh, risks in our area as well. How do you assess those risks right now? And for that, it's the unnamed threat. Neither Joe Biden nor Scott Morrison nor Boris Johnson would actually say it, but China. Yeah, well, uh, Stan, I think you're probably as much an expert as I am on China, but uh, clearly the people who work at ANU see this time of geopolitical tensions not going away anytime soon. They see it as being probably a generational thing. 
And so the strategists are trying to figure out how to keep Australia safe. Uh, certainly, I would say the majority of people that I've had a chance to talk to at my own institution, who work a lot on this, do think the nuclear submarines are tactically a good investment for Australia, but they come with lots of complications. They're very expensive, uh, and uh, of course, nuclear energy has not been something that Australia has been prepared to accept. I personally think it's, uh, you know, it, it has strengths and weaknesses, uh, and it should be considered as part of the energy mix uh, going forward, if it makes sense. I'm not sure right now. I agree with Lydia. I'm not sure that it does. But with respect to uh, nuclear subs, they have a lot of advantages. Um, there are a few disadvantages. And I think we have to let the experts in there kind of to plot a way forward uh, based on what they see as the geopolitical risk. Uh, that's not just five years, but it's 30 or 40 years. And we talk a lot about China now, but it's not just China. Mm. Uh, it's the whole region. There's there's three billion people in this part of the world, and it's going to get complicated over the next 50 years. Let's let's stay with this. Our next question on a similar subject to this comes from Justin Brown. This question is for Professor Birchik. Quantum technologies were one of the areas of collaboration outlined in the AUKUS Pact. What do we as a country stand to gain from this? Hold that thought, Michael. Um, <laughs> but a bit of tension is always is always a good thing. Toby, you think that this may be a 20th century technology that's going to be obsolete by the time that we actually um, are finally building them? Yes, I mean, a big manned submarine, very expensive piece of kit. <laughs> and we, I mean, we don't know what the price is going to be. Is it going to be 90 billion or is it going to be more? We don't know. But it's, it's going to be very expensive. Um, and we're only going to have a few number of them. Um, if you look at the way that the military is going today, it's increasingly to small, unpersoned, autonomous devices that are cheap, um, that will be much quieter, will be able to go to shallower waters. Um, so I, I do wonder if that's just these devices are a, a relic of 20th century diplomacy. Mm. Um, and they aren't actually ever going to be useful, in a military sense at least, uh, for fighting 20, 21st century wars. Yeah, and Michael, the, the submarines get all the attention, but there's a lot else we're talking about here, cyber capacity as well, changes to navigation capacity for submarines. There's a lot more to it than just the submarines, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, it, it, to use a crude analogy, the submarines were the tip of the spear in a strategic relationship that now aligns three members of the Five Eyes, the intelligence sharing nations. And I indeed, to the, to the question, one of the areas that was mentioned is this area of quantum technology that uses quantum physics in order to achieve new things. Right? One of the things that we can achieve is the construction of new kinds of sensors that allow us to navigate without GPS. This is something that we do in my company. Because this is what submarines are not using. They're not using GPS. Well, so they can't, of course, yeah. because they're, they're deep underwater. But this is a problem that's, that's you know, recognized by every Western government right now. The idea of GPS denial is a major strategic risk. So you know, what we do in my company, Q Control, uh, is we build new kinds of navigation systems that leverage quantum physics to give you stability over very long times. So what does that mean? It means you can run underwater with no GPS for very, very long periods and still navigate accuracy, accurately. So if you're going through underwater canyons or what, whatnot, this is extremely important, right? But this carries over to autonomous vehicle networks on the surface. It, it carries over to space-based technologies. At Q-Control, we have one of these Moon to Mars projects. So there are all these opportunities that flow from that initial application. And I think the, the AUKUS agreement with submarines as the starting point was uh, a, a wonderful nucleation of a technology sharing uh, agreement that has been brewing for many decades already between Australia and the US in quantum physics. Yeah, we're going to get to that question too a bit later on about quantum physics and what other areas it can be applied to. Our next question, though, comes from Jane Louise Lynch. As a casual relief teacher in Melbourne, I've worked across many schools and have seen that ventilation can be inadequate in many classrooms. Some schools do not even have windows that can be opened. Also, physical distancing is not possible with current class sizes. Why have ventilation and class sizes not been given adequate consideration as a game changer when it comes to airborne transmission in schools? And Lydia, just further to that, the whole recognition of the impact of airborne transmission was something we were late to overall, wasn't it? 
Well, very much so. And this is not just airborne transmission. We are talking about a, a lack of understanding of indoor air quality full stop. Um, this is something which we've never really thought, never really worried about, not just during the pandemic, before the pandemic coming, let's say, to, uh, uh, to the office coughing and sneezing and knowing that others will be infected. Nobody worried about this. So there's no, recog no uh, awareness recognition of indoor air quality full stop. And then part of this is not, uh, co no consideration to airborne transmission of COVID and lack of uh, taking on board of the need for ventilation. So this is not something which just started now. It's a problem now. This is a very, very deep problem of our, our society. So, uh, the WHO, the World Health Organisation, has released um, new figures as well and new guidelines on air quality. And a correlation isn't there between potentially the impact of COVID and places with poorer air quality. In places uh, with poor air, air quality, people are uh, um, uh, sicker, people are more vulnerable to other diseases. So that's very much the reason why they would be also vulnerable more to COVID. That's, that's right. Uh, yesterday, uh, new air quality guidelines uh, were released in Bonn and I was, uh, I'm proud of being a co-chair of the guideline development group. And I'll, I'll just stay with you, Lydia, on this. And, and one, of the, one of the things that, that Jane Louise was raising there is why have we not given adequate consideration to this? Where are we right, right now, given how slow we were to react? And as we start to open up, where are we on discussion around ventilation, particularly when it comes to schools? This, this conversation is only just beginning. So yesterday announcements in Victoria of the investment in schools in ventilation uh, and the whole package of measures taken, it's an extremely positive step. This is the first step really like this in the country. Uh, but in other states, this discussion hasn't started yet. And this discussion hasn't really extended to other areas of the society. It's not only schools, there are offices, there are restaurants, they are basically everywhere where we spend together. So we are just at the very, very beginning of this discussion. Lydia, thank you. We're going to have to say goodbye to you here at this part of the program. Lydia Morawska will leave us right now. Thank you so much for giving us your time tonight. Thank you for having me on the program. And let's go to our next question. It comes from Natasha Joyce. After proposing yet more cuts to courses and staffing, La Trobe University has this week announced that for anyone to be on campus from December, they need to be fully vaccinated. Could ensuring that universities provide COVID safe environments be a potential selling point for an industry that has been abandoned by federal government? Thank you. My name's Natasha Joyce. I'm from Bendigo in Victoria. Have a lovely day. Thank you, Natasha. What a lovely message. <laughs> and, and Brian, I'll, I'll go to you on that. Where are you at at the moment on getting students back and having the right protocols and protections? Yeah, well, of course, we're in lockdown here in Canberra, and uh, I don't see that uh, changing for the rest of the semester. We have five weeks left. So we're surely trying to get our head around 2022. Of course, it's quite an uh, interesting uh, environment where I don't think anyone really knows for sure. But we're going through systematically looking at, for example, air quality in our classrooms, in our buildings, trying to assess this, because there really hasn't been a lot of regulation there. And there's a trade-off. Normally, if you vent uh, air into buildings, uh, they become less energy efficient, for example. So there's filters and things that are new technology we're going to have to look at. With respect to vaccination, uh, we need to make sure that the environment we provide on our campus is safe. It's not really, you know, it's not, it has to be safe to a, a standard. What, so does that, think what, what, what does that mean, though, Brian, if I could just come in there? Um, does that mean that you're going to... I mean, are, are your staff going to be... Uh, is it going to be mandatory for them to be vaccinated? Are you going to have to have critical levels of vaccination before you can open up to having certain numbers of students back? Where are you at in really benchmarking this? Yeah, I mean, it looks to me that we will be over 95% vaccinated both within our staff and within our students, and we're going to be embedded in Canberra which is well on its way of also achieving over 95%. So at that point, uh, the modeling I have seen, but we need to keep on working on this as we understand uh, what's going on, indicates that requiring vaccination 
is not as important as probably other interventions we can do. But we're not going to be able to just have a wide open campus, it looks like, for the foreseeable future. We're going to have to have interventions with respect to air quality, masks, probably limits within rooms. Uh, and we're in the process of trying to understand exactly through the modeling, through our understanding of how this disease is progressing other ways, how we're going to run the campus next year. And that, 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 sounds, that sounds very open-ended, Brian. Um, it uh, is. So, so is this going to be more online teaching into next year? That changes the experience yeah. for, for the student? Are you looking at being in the middle of next year, towards the end of next year? It just seems to be a very open-ended process. Well, my, my hope is, Stan, that we will have our campus open to staff and to students uh, next year uh, at the beginning of term. But we have to be honest that we uh, don't completely understand how this disease is evolving. Uh, and there are going to be some restrictions. So m my belief is we will be able to have uh, you know, classes largely on campus. There might be restrictions to class size. Uh, there may be requirement for vaccination mm. in certain uh, situations where the health says we need to have it, uh, but we cannot put people at risk. And it's an evolving situation. We can see we're learning as we go. And so absolutely, my intent is to have the, the, the campus open, but I don't think it will be absolutely like it was in 2019, I'm mm. afraid. I want to bring Kirsten Banks, who's just joined us now. And Kirsten, that changes the nature of the experience, as I said, for both the student, for people working in the university as well. Um, what should we be looking at as we open up? The levels of exposure, the levels of risk, questions of ventilation, where do you sit on this? Look, I think the thing we need to keep in the forefront of our minds is to keep people safe. And keeping safe is keeping on top of things like exposure sites, making sure that people are vaccinated so that transmission is let down to a minimum. And look, I've been doing my PhD from home for half of the time I've been doing my PhD. Mm. I am really keen to get back into the <laughs> university. Uh, luckily, I'm in a field where I'm very privileged to be able to do that from home. As long as I have my laptop and a stable internet connection, I can do my research from home. But for many other researchers, that's been a very difficult time throughout these times where you cannot go to the universities. They're shut down. They're completely mm. locked from people going and doing what they need to do to advance our knowledge in science. Vanessa's agreeing with that furiously. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I work on whales as one of my primary species, and so it's li limited how you can get out to the ocean. We have to think about how we do things. People working in the laboratory, they have to change their whole way in which they make, make you know, assessments on certain bacterial cultures, that kind of thing. It changes a lot of things, and I feel really privileged to, and very fortunate, and I feel sorry for this next generation coming through in the PhD world right now. It's tricky because you don't have that face-to-face, -face, but also you can't go to international conferences. And the good thing is we've been able to adapt, and I think we need to look at the positives and adapting in this climate. We see parents teaching their children at home, and I'm sure a lot of teacher, parents rather are appreciative of their teachers right now. We're living in different times, but we're, be, we're adapting to it. And this is a good thing. We need to look at the positives. Yes, there are challenges, and I really do feel for those students going through these challenges. But out of this, we're, we're able to talk to each other in, remotely right now. People are watching us on devices in different parts of the world, but safe. Mm. And this is the main thing forward. So there's, there's some positives that come out of a bad situation. But we haven't addressed the other part of the question, which is how the universities have been abandoned. Mm. The, there was a recent study that said to May last this year, 40,000 jobs, one fifth of the workforce have, have gone because universities were denied job keeper, job seeker. That is something that we really have to worry about. Uh, universities are going to be driving the innovation that gets us out of, the, out of this pandemic. The, they've been developing the vaccines. Um, what does that say to, about this country that we have? There, there was a billion, there was a billion dollars in research um, uh, program support. Was that not enough? It's not enough because you know, all the overseas students were unable to come. 40,000 jobs disappeared. To put that in context, uh, the coal industry, which we do seem to support, or politicians seem to support, employs 39,000 people. So that's more than the coal industry has disappeared. And that's that's a, a, a generational loss. It, it does raise the question too, Michael, and this has been raised before, that whether there was much reliance on money from overseas, to, which would ultimately go through to funding this, was, as part of the model, 
Was there too much reliance on overseas students and overseas funding? Yeah, I, I have to say, so I'm, a, I'm an academic too, right, at the University of Sydney. I, I absolutely despise this question, right? Universities, not, not you, Stan, of course. Uh, <laughs> I'm happy to be despised. <laughs> universities, like any other organization, respond to incentives, right? And they follow the pathways that are open to them. The government regulates universities in Australia. It's not like the US system where there are these private institutions that can, within some bounds, do have quite a lot of latitude. It's not the same here. You can't just raise fees uh, on your own. You can't just change student numbers on your own. Because of that, universities were forced into a circumstance where all the research funding was getting tighter and tighter. Uh, all these things called research infrastructure block grants that come on top of grants, they were all getting cut and cut and cut. And so what is the one lever that universities were left with it was undergraduate enrollments. And so they followed the incentives. They acted like good businesses, just like the government always asks for. And, you know, yes, something catastrophic has happened uh, to the market. But I mean, I, I wanted actually to come back to, to Brian's point earlier, and maybe I'll give you a, a little bit of a, a pointed response. We, yes, we talked about safety, and yes, we as academics want a safe work environment. We also want the institutions for which we work to speak up as leaders. So even though vaccination as a, as a mandate may not change things based on a 95% level and the amount of uh, other non-pharmaceutical interventions that are available, why not come out and say, as a scientifically driven, fact-based organization, we believe that vaccines are essential, except for those who have immunocompromised circumstances mm -hmm. and the like, right? Let's be leaders instead of always running and being afraid of, uh, of the politicians. Brian, just a quick response to that. Yeah, absolutely. Every time I talk to my staff, I say, get vaccinated. Mm. And uh, the question is, do I tell them because it's the right thing we'll to mandate do? mandate it. Or do I mandate it? And uh, that's, that's a really interesting, hard question. I'm going to try to get to the 99% level without mandating. And if I need to mandate, I will for health and safety reasons. Would you say mandate, Michael? I say mandate because it sends a message, not because I think people won't listen. Mm. Our next question comes from Matilda Byrne has the potential to bring great benefits to society, but the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights recently called for a moratorium of AI systems that threaten human rights. It seems to be that one of the biggest risks is the affront to human dignity if machines are given life and death decisions, for example, as with autonomy in weapons. What are your views on delegating life death decisions to machines, and what can be done to address the development of lethal autonomous weapons? And indeed, we've already seen this, haven't we? We've seen increasing use of drones um, in warfare, and we talk now about the emergence of the, the robot army that's going to change the very nature of warfare. We do, and it, it's a concern that I have. It's a concern that thousands of my colleagues, my, the majority of, of the people that I work with, share that we're entering a, a new revolution in warfare. I mean, the first revolution in warfare was the invention of of gunpowder. The second re revolution was the invention of nuclear weapons. This is the third revolution that will allow us to scale warfare, do um, terrible, inhumane things. And so what, what you're talking about as well is that if we're talking about robot soldiers, these are indefatigable. They're not going to be fed, they can fight 24-7 and they're not going to make, if they're not programmed this way, not going to make human decisions. They're not. E ethical or compassionate decisions. They don't have our humanity. They don't, mm. don't ha have our conscience. They can't be punished. They can't be held accountable. It's, it's not Terminator. It's not some you know, intelligent humanoid robot with a red glint in its eye that Hollywood would have you believe. It's much simpler technologies. It's, it's things like, as you say, um, drones that, that are already being used in, mm. in uh, attack in Libya. And, and, and it's actually called, they use this phrase, don't they, a more humane warfare. They, they do, and, and it's, not, I'm not, it's not clear to me that it will be more humane. It will be a, perhaps a faster way to kill people, um, and they will do whatever you program them to do. Um, and previously, if you wanted to do harm, you had to persuade an army of people to do that. Um, but now you would just need one programmer. How do you feel, Michael, about the ethical decisions that we make? And it's not just, you know, we're talking about warfare here, but there are a whole lot of ethical questions around robots and and who, whether robots do harm to human beings. Isn't it the first, the first, the first the law? First law. That's right, must not do harm. But in fact, we can't guarantee that. No, we can't guarantee that any technology that we build won't be used against us by artificial intelligence or by our adversaries in another country or our neighbors down the street. Um, it is a very challenging issue. 
and I think it will remain the subject of debate in perpetuity, right? How do, not only how do we uh, empower robots to make life and death decisions, whether it's uh, an autonomous drone that's going to have a strike on, on some target, or it's the Tesla on autopilot that decides if it's gonna kill you or it's gonna kill the, uh, uh, the group of, passenger, of uh, bystanders on the street. Um, you know, these, these issues are going to be persistent, but then it's going to be the question of how do we treat robots? Mm. Uh, that's another ethical question. And uh, the, the point that I want to make is that this is not, in my view, unique. I think it is endemic to any advance in technology. We always have to ask ethical questions, and we should always be asking questions and not looking at this as, as the, the one thing that breaks civilization. But we, we come back to the China question, because yeah. China has made it very clear that they're seeking economic and military dominance by becoming a leader in AI. They're not, they're not announcing that they're going to build nuclear attack submarines. They're announcing that they're building um, underwater autonomous submarines. Mm. And, and away from, away from, uh, from warfare, um, you said by 2050, if we're looking at a, a, a robot world, that you'll have a, a robot football team that will win the World Cup. I mean, it's not just warfare, but the way this changes everything in our lives. Yeah, it's hard to think of a part of our life that won't be touched by technology that can do um, smart things like this. Kirsten, just before we move on to our next question, um, th this question of, of ethics uh, and robots, we're talking about warfare, we're talking about the more extreme, dramatic examples uh, of that. But there are simpler things. I remember one person once saying, why were all robots white? <laughs> um, why, why does Siri have a female voice? What values are we building into artificial intelligence? Do you think much about that or does that concern you? Well, when it comes to technology, I'm either really excited about it or really scared by it. Uh, the, the conversation that you were having before about having robots being able to fight 24-7, that is extremely concerning to me. Uh, but on the other hand, having a smartwatch on mm. my hand here, being able to track my health data, that is really fascinating to me. And so I think there are some really innovative ways that we can use AI for good in ways that are fun as well and engaging with not just scientists but also the general public. I'm told by 2050 as well that um, robots will read the news, but it's already happening. <laughs> Sam, I should just add to that as well. Another really good example that we're doing here in Australia is using... We're teaching computers to look for animals in, in animal trafficking. Unfortunately, wildlife trafficking mm. is a global problem and that's some of the work I'm currently working on. Using innovative technologies to teach computers that that's an animal, that's a lizard, we need to work complementary with people, there's the border force as well as sniffer dogs, that this is something we need to do to protect our natural biodiversity. And that's a great example. Our next question comes from Peter Struckel. Hello, here's a question for Brian Schmidt. Do you think the expansion of the universe is accelerating because the rest of the universe is trying to get desperately away from planet Earth and from mankind and all its irrational behaviours. <laughs> they may be running from the robots as well, Brian. <sighs> yes, well, sometimes I do ask that question myself. Uh, so, you know, the, the expansion of the universe, the actual expansion, uh, not the acceleration, the expansion uh, happened uh, because at the time of the Big Bang, the universe started expanding. And we don't really know why the Big Bang occurred, but 13.7 billion years ago, give or take 100 million years, uh, something happened, the universe was formed, started expanding. Now, what's really interesting is the, uh, the, the discovery that I was part of in 1998 is that the universe is actually speeding up mm. because to speed up, something's got to be pushing on the universe. And that, that push, which we ascribe to what we call dark energy or what Einstein in 1917 uh, called the cosmological constant, energy that spread everywhere very finely in uh, the universe, kind of explains what we see, but we don't know why it is there. And so my hope, but not yet realized, and probably not realized in my, my life, unless we get lucky, is understanding why the cosmological constant, why energy is thinly spread throughout, the spa uh, throughout space, and maybe that's a way of linking gravity and the quantum world uh, that we've been talking about here tonight. And it, it, it might be the sort of the answer to the biggest questions of physics that we have is the theory of everything could emerge from that, but we're not there yet. We were talking about this before we came on and, um, and Toby and I uh, sort of asked the, the big question that's always asked this time, Kirsten, I'll put it to you. How can the universe expand when it's already infinite? Mm. 
This is quite the loaded question and something that I struggle to understand myself. So, <laughs> thank you for putting me on my toes. But you're and still doing your PhD, today. so we're, we're, we're exactly. I'm still you. just a little baby researcher. Please be nice. Um, but it's it's definitely a mind-boggling thing to think that the universe is infinite, but also thinking it's expanding. The way that we understand the world around us is that if something expands, it must be expanding into something. But that's not really the case with the universe as far as we know. We know that there is this Hubble bubble, which is honestly should be a bubblegum flavour, this <laughs> Hubble bubble of the observable universe that we can physically see. Beyond that, there is more space. That space is expanding away from us greater at greater than the speed of light. So we can no longer see those parts of space. And really, it's, it's just a lot, mm. to and, put it frankly. It's a lot of space. And, and just quickly, to hurt our brains even more, um, Michael, there may not be more, one universe either. Multiple, yeah. at simultaneously. <laughs> you know, people love to, to talk about quantum physics, this discipline where I work. It's the small scale of things instead of the really big universe scale of things as, as really difficult to understand, as, as mind-boggling. Weird, I think that, is the word. <laughs> that blew my... This idea that it's expand... The universe is expanding into nothing. Thing. <laughs> I, I, I'm, a, I'm a professional physicist and I still cannot get my head around that. There, okay. There's that famous Albert Einstein quote, the two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity. <laughs> I'm not sure about the universe. <laughs> Our next question comes from Tim Davis. The digital computer as we know it has had enormous success due to its design that enables virtually any computing algorithm to be implemented. This is not true for quantum computers. Since their inception 40 years ago, there have only been a few algorithms developed, such as for factoring large numbers to crack online security, or doing large combinatoric manipulations, or acting like an old-fashioned analog computer to simulate quantum systems. None of these processes are useful for most people. You would never want to do this with your smartphone. So why the huge research effort and expense? My question to the panel. Are scientists just playing on the success of digital computers to trick governments into funding their toy quantum computer projects? Or do they really think quantum computers have a use for the general public more than just destroying internet banking security? <laughs> Mike, I think Tim might have said you're having a lend of us. <laughs> when, when the ENIAC, the world's first digital electronic computer, the one that, that actually looks a lot like the computers that we carry around on our mobile phones. When that was built and commissioned in 1947, there was only one application for it. They spent millions of dollars in the 40s. The application was calculating artillery shell trajectories. And today we have Facebook mm -hmm. and we have Uber and we have like all the things that have transformed our world, including of course supercomputing and, and uh, in the cloud. Look, there's a discovery process that goes on. Now the questioner uh, was correctly pointing out that the number of applications that we understand right now as being potentially beneficial for quantum computers, this new kind of information processing system is small. His list was uh, incorrectly truncated. There are, there are other optimization problems they're called that we know map to real challenges that we care about in finance, in material science. Mm -hmm. Um, chemistry. In, in chemistry, but also things like transport route optimization, logistics optimization. These are things that we think can come much sooner than these very, very hard problems that the questioner alluded to about, about cryptography, right? But it's a, it's a journey of discovery. And if, if we just stop because it was, uh, you know, one or two applications and not as many as 70 years of classical computing, then, uh, then you know, we would build nothing. And people at home are probably going, Qu quantum computers, what is the difference? Why a quantum computer? If we're talking about the computers we know, they operate on binary signals, right? If you're talking about quantum computers, you're talking about multiple signals. So the possibilities are greater and the speed potentially is greater for solving problems. Yeah, I mean, look, the best way to think about it, in my view, is it's just a computer that obeys different rules. And because it obeys different rules, the kinds of problems it can solve are different. And you know, this paradigm is actually not so crazy. You know, we, we do talk a lot about general purpose digital computers. That's the kind of computer we use in our laptop or in our mobile phones. But there are a whole range of special purpose digital computers that we use right now. They're called 
field programmable gate arrays. You have five of them in your car. Mm. We use something called a GPU, a graphical processing unit, which is a reasonably narrow in its capability uh, processing system that's used for AI right now. Originally, it was used just for graphics rendering. It found a new application. So I think, um, yes, there is a, 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 a culture uh, a cultural imprint, I guess, that comes from the prevalence and the ubiquity of classical digital computers. So much so that we've forgotten how many other specialized bits of technology exist. Mm. And I think that quantum computers, this new kind of computer that solves certain problems better, they're going to enter our mix and they're just gonna be another kind of computational tool that we have. Vanessa, what opportunities do you see here and for cooperation as well across various different disciplines of science? Well, I love that science is so collaborative and it's colourful in my opinion and to get a, a room full of different scientists from different disciplines is so exciting and that's what I love about science. You know, it really is, and I'm, I'm obviously biased, but <laughs> to be able to bring a, a group of experts from working on a project, like with our whale drone research, mm. we collect whale snot using drones and some people may have heard of whale snot before but if you don't even care about whales or the ocean i hope that that sound of whale snot got your attention right now Be because it does tell us a lot doesn't it about yeah. the health of our oceans the health of our planet that's right and in the past to collect health information from whales we relied on <laughs> killing whales and getting close to them and they're pretty big but my point is Really, using a whole skill set of different people from different disciplines. I wasn't, I'm still not a drone expert, but thankfully I've been able to collaborate with, with drone experts to create this design for accessing and collecting biological juicy information from a whale as it breathes. I mean, it is lung bacteria. We're all used to being sampled right now. But to do it with a drone and without the whale potentially knowing it's happening, that's, that's science right there and that's collaboration. Let's go to our next question. It comes from Ashley Neal. This question is for Kirsten Banks. As an astrophysicist with Aboriginal heritage, uh, what can the world's oldest culture bring to STEM? And more specifically, what can it bring to astrophysics? Kirsten. Well, it's a fantastic question. And I want to steer here to a challenge that we're facing a lot here in Australia, and that's with climate change, which is related to astrophysics in some way too, and more so within sustainability in this country. And there is so much we can learn from Indigenous culture and cultural practices that have been prevalent in this country for tens of thousands of years. Two examples I would like to give to you today is one on cultural burning. We had the awful bushfires mm. a couple of years ago and seeing that hazardous, hazard reduction burning has been proven to destroy or at least harm habitats and wildlife. But by using cultural knowledge and cultural burning, known as cool burning, it preserves those habitats a lot better, providing the same or very similar sort of protection as hazard reduction, but still preserving those habitats and the wildlife as well. So we get kind of two for one there. We're getting the safety, but also preserving our wildlife. Another one I'd like to give to you, this is a really cool example that I learned about recently, is spinifex grass. If you've been out in the outback, you've very likely seen spinifex. It's everywhere, it covers a third of Australia. And with indigenous practices, they cultivate this grass to produce this natural glue and biodegradable glue. And within this grass, they've also found nanofibers, which are thousands of times smaller than a human hair, but five times stronger than steel. And using this technology, using this nanofibers from this plant that has been cultivated through indigenous mm. knowledge has been able to improve and strengthen concrete, meaning that we don't have to produce as much concrete because you need less of it because now it's stronger with those nanofibers than having less carbon emissions from producing that concrete in the first place. Also with PPE currently, we have gloves, mm -hmm. uh, even going off to the left side here, condoms as well. <laughs> Putting this spinifex and these nanofibers into these rubber uh, materials strengthens them without uh, breaking down their, uh, they don't break as often and also it doesn't mess with the, uh, the feel of it as well. So that's one way that <laughs> indigenous <laughs> cultures can help us through to create these more, um, biodegradable and sustainable materials. Spin effects condoms, we've got it all covered here. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't ask you your opinion on that, Brian, but I, I, <laughs> I would ask you about where we are with incorporating just that knowledge that Kirsten was talking about 
into our science, into the teaching of science, whether we are really serious about this or whether it's still lip service or something that we think we're duty bound to talk about and then move on to the, re the real science in inverted commas? Yeah, well, I think we're on a journey. And when I think about when I, about 10 years ago, I was at the National Museum of Australia and they were starting to talk about storylines and how, uh, you know, the indigenous Australians navigated around and storyline of the seven sisters. And I was like, seven sisters, like mm. the, the, the Pleiades. And the story was told to me and I'm like, but that's the same story that is in Europe and in North America and in Thailand. And then you start realizing that astronomy, which goes back to the foundations of science, but the, the literally something that every society has used as uh, part of their culture. And you suddenly realize that we are bound by astronomy uh, and the seven sisters, Pleiades, visible every, to every culture uh, on the planet just because they're near the celestial equator is something that binds us. It binds us from 60,000 years ago mm. plus, when we were clearly all one people. And astronomy is not just you know, technology and understanding cosmology. It is part of the advance of civilization. It's something the entire world has to do together. It's a, it's a global project. And I think being able to understand and share in the oldest living uh, cultures here in Australia. It's been one of the great gifts, gifts for me of being able to move from the United States here because I've suddenly got this appreciation of uh, a, a shared history which goes back 60,000 years I've never had before. Mm. So I think, it's, I think it's really very moving for me personally. And we're learning together uh, to appreciate uh, humanity, which is a shared history. It's fascinating as well, Michael, when you look at cosmology there and you look at indigenous notions of time, um, the circularity of time and, and past and present and future coexisting. And that's precisely, isn't it, the sort of... When you look at the quantum world and shrink things to that level where you're seeing just this type of thing playing out. Yeah, I think, I think what it signals is uh, a reminder that science is a human endeavour, mm. right? That, yes, we may, as professionals, we seek the truth. We seek to understand the way the universe is. But we are not infallible, right, as, as history has shown over and over again. We are part of a community, and the work that we do benefits the broader community. That is why we do it. Science is in the public interest. And yes, it delivers economic prosperity. 26% of all economic activity in Australia comes from scientific discoveries in the last 20 years, according to the chief scientist. So yes, there are all these other benefits, but I think uh, uh, the the... The discussion just a moment ago highlights how much this can be something that brings us together uh, because it, it's all about touching and shaping our lives and our understanding of the world. And it's a story here and we're glad to have you on the program being able to share it with us, Kirsten. Our next question comes from Bill Clappers. Hello. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is said to be the largest telescope ever placed in space, a hundred times more powerful than the Hubble Telescope able to see way back in time, billions of years, uh, orbiting the Earth four times further out than the Moon. Uh, set to launch later this year after many delays, is it going to go ahead? Uh, how long after the launch will it take for the data to come through? And uh, what are the big questions that uh, it seeks to resolve? Thank you. And yes, it is going to go ahead. It was meant to go ahead, I think, in 2010, but it's going to go ahead this year in December 18, costing 10 times what it would have cost had it gone ahead um, all those years ago. Kirsten, you were clapping as soon as that question was, was asked. What excites you about this? Everything <laughs> excites me about this. We have been waiting for so long for the James Webb Space Telescope to launch. Like you said, from 2010, it's been delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. Uh, it was supposed to launch late in October this year, but then delayed again to December this year. And fingers crossed, please let that thing finally go into space because it's going to really broaden our horizons and help us understand more about our universe. Using its six metre wide mirror, it's much bigger than Hubble and we'll be able to see much further than Hubble as well. One of the things that I'm really excited to hopefully see come out of 
the James Webb Space Telescope is seeing light from the very first stars of our universe. Wow. The first stars to ever be born. That's an exciting thing <laughs> to look forward to. That, that answers your question, I think, Michael, before about how do we even begin to understand this? This is really opening things Look, up. Look, I, I, lo I love this stuff. Yeah. Now, I'm not an astronomer, I'm not an astrophysicist. I barely understand uh, the, the general physics that, that uh, is being discussed here. But there is just something so profound uh, in looking at, say, a photograph of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, right? This, this image where you, you look at the image and it looks like a collection of stars and apparently the story is the astronomer just wanted to look in some random place, right? And, and it, yeah, it looks like a, a shot of the night sky until you look really closely, you zoom in mm. and zoom in, and each one of those stars is actually an entire galaxy. Yeah. Right, it's absolutely mind-blowing. And, and it raises the question, we're talking about artificial intelligence, but of course, um, even the Pentagon now says that something may be out there that they can't explain, Toby. What is it going to tell us about the potential of life as well elsewhere? Well, I mean, the big question, uh, one of the biggest questions that science has yet not answered is, are we alone? Mm. And, uh, you know, it's a very big universe. Um, uh, it would be terribly sad if there were no other voices to hear. How do you feel about that, Vanessa? Well, I just want to put out, there's obviously a, a very strong presence for this, the, the, the space that we're, we're part of. But we know more about space than we do know about the deepest part of our oceans. Now, the oceans are important to all of us right here. They're important to all of you at home, whether you're watching this on iView or wherever you're watching this. The ocean generates the 50, more than 50% of the air we breathe. It transports the goods that we have here, from the clothes that I'm wearing to the device that you're watching me mm. on right now. We need to learn more about, and, and I, I, I love science learning about everything, but we also need to have a focus on life on land yes. and in the water and on Earth. The and mysteries, the I'm, mysteries I'm of the stars and, and the deep. Our final question tonight comes from Leah Jabaili. How do I become a wildlife scientist and what is your favourite animal? What's your favourite animal? Oh, I would have to say it's the whale. And <laughs> because this is... I, I was hoping the kids would stay up late for this show right now. I'm sure they have. Thankfully, I've got Winston here. <laughs> and I just thought, why not bring a prop? It's a science show. This is how I communicate science. The whale is my favourite animal. They're big. In fact... Being next to a whale in the water, you literally have to turn from one side to another. They're so big, they're as big as a bus. And if you're in a car and you look at your family-sized car, that's how big it's, their and... babies are. But to become a wildlife scientist and to do what I do, you need to be passionate, and I'm sure you do have passion. I'm sure the people watching this show are passionate about what they do. Doing something that you love is really important. And in Australia, to, to help foster that next generation... For, for the jobs that don't even exist yet is something that's important. And to follow your passion and do something in terms of helping animals and saving whales by learning about them and learning about our environment is something that we can all contribute. And you don't have to be a marine scientist or a wildlife scientist to do that. We can all make changes at home every day. Don't pour chemicals down the drain. And, um, you know, make sure you throw your rubbish in a bin. But be proactive. The skills that you have at acquire at skill, yeah. uh, at school rather, or those jobs that you might have at a supermarket, these are all skills that you can take on board for the later future career of you becoming a wildlife scientist. And ask questions. <laughs> Talk to scientists. We're not scary. We're approachable. And <laughs> social media is. I can vouch great. for that. You've been very approachable. We have great Brian. shoes too. Come on. And great. We have great <laughs> shoes. And great we don't shoes. Talk here. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, um, I don't know if you've got a favourite animal, but you may have a future student there. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I was trying to think what animal uh, have I seen that I most want to be? I grew up in Alaska, uh, so I've seen a lot of whales, but I like sea otters probably better than any other animal. So another sea mammal, uh, and I'm not just playing to the crowd here. Kirsten, a, a favourite animal and some advice from someone doing their PhD to someone who wants to be a scientist. Well, firstly, my favourite animal would have to be the cockatoo. They are so cheeky, but very, very <laughs> smart as well. But the thing that I would love to put forward to you is, and to all the kids watching today, is to follow your passions. And if you don't know what you want to do yet, try things. That was the advice that I was given on my first day of high school, is to try and take opportunities when they come. And Good that's advice. that's what's gotten me here today. Good so advice. keep following your dreams. A final word from you, Toby, in about 30 seconds or so. Well, my favourite animal still is humans, despite all our failings. <laughs> and I'm despite working on robots. <laughs> I'm still optimistic that, 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 that we have hope. 
Indeed, indeed we do. And we have hope because of the fantastic people we've been able to share this hour with and the incredible knowledge that they've been able to share with us as well. That's all we have time for on our program this evening. Thanks again to our incredible panel, Toby Walsh, Brian Schmidt, Vanessa Perotta, Michael Biersick and Kirsten Banks. And thank you as well for all of your questions. Next week, David Spears is in the chair. He'll be live in Melbourne looking at the issue we did touch on a bit tonight, but one that's going to continue for all of us, the vexed issue of mandatory vaccination. And you can join me on Monday evening picking up our China conversation from earlier as well on our China Tonight program. Until then, have a fantastic night. Thanks for joining us.